At 4D, what we do is we actually uh, take uh, bacteria, single strains of bacteria that we isolate from healthy individuals and we develop those as drugs, just like any other drug. Um, obviously, that has certain uh, unique features, you know, that our products tend to be uh, very safe in terms of their, their safety profile. Um, they come from uh, the, the collection of bacteria in the gut, known as the microbiota. And over recent years, uh, it's been established that the microbiota can be involved in the maintenance of health and various disease conditions. And what we're doing is actually taking single strains of those bacteria and we're characterizing them in terms of their ability to impact the human body, particularly the immune system. Then we purify those bacteria, put them into a capsule and, and give them orally as drugs. This is a bacteria, it's a species of Enterococcus that we isolated from a healthy individual. And the interesting thing about uh, this type of bacteria, and 518 in particular, is that it has what we call an immunostimulatory profile. So in the assays that we use to screen the bacteria, we established that it was able to actually switch on different uh, components of the immune system and, and do things which we felt uh, would be beneficial um, in cancer. And indeed, preclinically, that proved to be the case. So when we actually um, dose this bacteria, or bacteria orally, we're actually able to show that it can impact uh, tumor growth, it can slow down tumor growth, uh, and extend survival in those preclinical models. A good place to start is to explain that over the last few years, over the last five years or so, the role of the microbiota, so the, the bacteria in the gut in particular, has been established as being quite important in respect of how uh, patients might respond to checkpoint therapies. So there are certain profiles of microbiota that would indicate a more a higher likelihood of response. Uh, that research emerged around about the same time as we uh, discovered MRX 518 and what we thought we'd do is actually use the functionality with MRX 518 um, to actually see whether we could um, stimulate the activity of, of a checkpoint inhibitor uh, like Pembro. So the, the study itself is, is, is a collaboration, um, is in collaboration with Merck. Um, what we're doing is we're actually uh, evaluating the combination of MRX 518 and PEMBRO to actually work in patients who've developed what's known as secondary resistance uh, to, those, to, to that checkpoint therapy. So these are patients who previously will have responded um, to a PD-1 or a PD-L1 checkpoint therapy, but that response will have, will have waned, it will have, it will have stopped. Um, and that can happen in, in you know, a significant percentage of patients. When that does happen, they obviously come off the drug they may go on to other drugs. Uh, and what we're doing is to um, the patients that are coming into the trial, we're actually putting them on MRX 518 and PEMBRO to see whether we can reactivate the activity of that checkpoint therapy. The data that we have so far um, is from the first phase of the study. Um, and the, 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 for the first phase of the study, part A, uh, was very much uh, focused on safety. Um, in in the trial itself, we're including patients with non-small cell lung cancer, uh, renal cell carcinoma, bladder cancer, uh, and melanoma. So in part A of the study, what we showed was that, um, uh, in, in, particularly in the case of renal cell carcinoma, the combination of MRX 518 and PEMBRO appeared to be able uh, to, to, to show a signal of efficacy in some of those patients. So even though we were screening for safety, in part A, we've been monitoring those patients and there are 12 patients that came into part A. And in some instances, we're seeing examples of uh, the combination actually generating a uh, partial response or stable disease, uh, which is obviously in a patient group who have, have come into the study with aggressive disease, having failed um, all available approved therapies. Part B of the study is, is really very exciting for us. We've obviously got these, these early signals of potential efficacy. Um, we've got in, in renal cell carcinoma um, and also potentially non-small cell lung cancer as well. So the idea of part B of the study is really to expand the cohorts of patients in the individual tumor types. So uh, in up to 30 patients uh, in each of the tumor types in the study, we'll be carrying out uh, treatment with a combination of the therapy. We'll be trying to increase the, uh, the signals that, that we're seeing, which will give us greater confidence to actually progress uh, MRX 518 um, through a more rapid and accelerated 
uh, approval program, hopefully. And we're just at the start of the story for MRX 518. We're looking um, in this you know, particularly difficult to treat patient population right now, uh, you know, the, the patient population who has uh, developed second resistance to, to checkpoint therapy. But there's no reason to, to, to suppose that MRX 518 wouldn't have effect, effect potentially earlier uh, in the treatment paradigm. So um, all the way through to you know, first-line therapy, either in combination or potentially even as a monotherapy. And one of the one of the key features that we've seen, in addition to the exciting uh, signals of, of, of efficacy, is that this 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 combination of MRX 518 in particular uh, appears to have a very good safety profile. So obviously, when you're looking at um, uh, oncology treatments, uh, increasingly uh, people are moving towards doublet or triplet treatments, which it could be associated with, with toxicities. And we see MRX518 as having a lot of potential in some indications where it can be added in uh, to potentially increase the efficacy uh, without causing any, any side effects issues. The center of our strategy in many ways, you know, there are trillions of bacteria uh, that, that are present inside us. They all have uh, you know, functionality which has evolved alongside us. And, uh, we've already demonstrated and many others have demonstrated the impact that they can have on, on the immune system. And they, they, they can be very powerful immunomodulators, but obviously they've evolved in the context of, of coexisting with us. So in all of the programs that, that we've taken to the clinic so far, we've not seen any concerning signals of, of, of toxicity or safety issues. And that really is quite a, a unique feature of, of this class of medicines. You know, to be able to actually modulate the immune system with the same power uh, as a traditional biologic, but without uh, side effects, it shows that there's a lot of potential. Um, and you know, oncology is one of the areas that, that we that, that we're looking at. It's our, it's our really are uh, one of the most exciting areas where we think there's going to be the, 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 the quickest impact on healthcare. But we also have programs uh, where we're looking at um, different bacteria, different single strains um, in respiratory medicine. For instance, we just recently. Uh, started a COVID study. We, we have a, a study uh, in asthma. Uh, we have um, a study in gastro, so a, a large study in IBS that we'll read out shortly. Um, and also, we've got some earlier uh, preclinical work that shows that single strains of bacteria can have effects in, in uh, neurodegenerative disorders as well. So, there really is a lot of potential here. Um, it's a question of where we think the impact can be made first. And, and really, what we're seeing, you know, we think we've generated. The first uh, the signal, the real sort of proof of concept um, in the 518 k study that, that shows that this, this could really have a major impact on healthcare.